All right, so here we are once again at the Kentuckiana FileMaker Developers Group. I am Ron Glenn Cates of RGC Data. Uh, and today I'm gonna be demonstrating a calendar that uh, was de developed out of uh, necessities that just couldn't, I couldn't quite find the right fit with all of the uh, JavaScript calendars that are available. So um, go ahead and share my screen. So to start with, just kind of to prefix how this all came about was uh, working on a project. Actually, I had two different projects going at the same time that needed a calendar. Um, and both of them had completely different needs for that calendar. Um, and so I started to explore all of the different calendars that were available out there, including the add-on calendar that uh, is uh, available through Claris. Um, and I started experimenting with those. And, and the frustration that I ran into is that you know, I'm a FileMaker developer, I'm not a, uh, a JavaScript developer. And so many of the solutions, be it the add-ons from Claris or some of the others that are out there, um, I just didn't have enough control over them. You know, maybe I'm a little OCD about that as well. The fact that, you know, when I'm putting together a solution and building it, I wanna be able to make changes to anything that I wanna change. Um, I want to change the behavior. I want to change the look. I want to have the control to tailor it to my needs that way. And, and the JavaScript solutions that were available, either I just had no idea how to make those changes, or it wasn't even possible to get into them to make the changes. Um, I, I don't know where you would go to make some changes on some of the add-ons that, that Claris provides once you pop it into and it gets installed into your FileMaker if you ever, if I wanted to make changes to the actual JavaScript, I wouldn't even know where it's stored. How you, how do you get to it to make those changes? Um, so some of the things were even just some little things that were just annoying to me was the text size of of the display and 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 everything. It was like uh, for the design that I was working on, the calendar just felt really oversized, and the, the text felt oversized, and. I had no idea or there was no place that I was aware of that could actually, where I could make those changes. Um, and then just some of the other ways that the behaviors uh, just didn't fit my needs. So I started uh, thinking that at first it was like, oh yeah, everybody's using JavaScript calendars. That's the way, that's what you do if you wanna do a, a calendar solution. So I, I explored all of that. And then I just started thinking based on our my client's needs, the functionality was, there was a lot more in some cases than was necessary, and it was a lot different in some cases that it was necessary. So I started thinking of it more in terms of what can I do that will just cover the basic needs that it need to be met? Um, so it's like wanting to throw out some of the bells and whistles, because there were almost too many bells and whistles, and I wanted to try and simplify it. Um, and I also really wanted to be able to build something natively in FileMaker, because that is something that I have more control over and that I can edit and tailor. And so I'm going to show a couple of the finished products for these calendars that I uh, put together. And then I will uh, demonstrate the technique and how, how it comes together. So here's one of the calendars. So, so this is built completely natively in FileMaker. And here's the one... One of the biggest things about trying to build a calendar in FileMaker that was a challenge was how do you build a grid in FileMaker that is scalable and sizable? Um, and that was the big thing. And I know, uh, you know, some of the stuff that had been talked about and what, what Jonathan had brought up is that techniques like this have been done in the past using um, repeating fields. Um, and Repeating fields is kind of a, a thing for me that I, I don't think I've ever used them uh, maybe once or twice ever um, for just very small things. Like I've not worked very much in repeating fields. It just wasn't something that I'd gotten into very much. And just, it still seemed like there were some limitations there. Uh, and of course the repeating field idea that, that we talked about was the same thing as you can do a repeating field with seven repeats. Uh, repetitions, and then you could anchor it, and then that would stretch at least one way. But then how do you get it to stretch the other way? And that's when Jonathan suggested to me and, and that uh, it would somehow involve a portal, um, and that you could anchor the portal and anchor the repeating field within the portal so that the portal, rather than stretching and increasing the number of rows, would stretch the content of each row. 
And so all that sounded fine and good, but uh, I just didn't like the idea of using repeating fields. And so that's when the, the thought came. And I don't remember if it was Jonathan or I that made the suggestion that, uh, what about a button bar? And that's where the, the button bar comes in. So the calendar that you're looking at is created out of a, a uh, portal and a button bar. And well, this in fact is created with three different layered button bars because I wanted to layer some things differently, but essentially it's a, it's a portal and a button bar and you can create a grid and a calendar grid. Um, and that's what we've done here. And so in this case, this particular solution just needed to be able to show the number of assets that were reserved for each day and how many were checked out um, and checked back in. And so I was able to accomplish that with this. Um, and this, the other nice thing about this system, uh, the, this technique that uh, I put together is the fact that the data is pulled from one relationship. Um, so it basically is grabbing a list of all the data that's needed. And what I do is, what I did is I created a calculation field that uh, concatenates the data that I want to be able to have, have access to. And then it, um, then I do a list to list all that out. So you've got basically lines and lines of data that contain the data that I needed. And so I'm using the while function to loop through those lines of data and look for all the ones with the matching date. So that's where this came in. And then one of the other solutions was this one here that you, is like a time log that shows log entries. Um, and then I also have a travel log uh, that shows where people have uh, scheduled travel. Um, and again, with the existing solutions that were out there in JavaScript, like those are kind of like three different ways of wanting to use a calendar and no, no existing JavaScript solution that I could find was able to accommodate all three different ways that I wanted to use it. Um, so that's where that, the idea comes back to mind that if I could develop something that I have full control over, then I can uh, determine how it's going to be used and, and make all those different types of calendars that I wanted to make. So um, that's pretty much where the idea came from. So I'm going to start this off by kind of, uh, we're just going to build it. I'm going to build it right, uh, right in this group. And uh, I did do a few things to get started with. Uh, it essentially, first thing I needed to do was be able to control the month and year, let's go over here. So, uh, so this is what I have. So basically the system just has two global variables, the year and the month. And then, and again, this is something that uh, could easily be done with globals, but I just have this thing about, I like to work with variables. I like to work with global variables or layout variables so that I can um, make it modular. Uh, so if I were using globals in a global table for the month and the year, if I wanted to have a different calendar on a different layout or even open a different window and I change the, the month or the year, uh, it's changing that value in that one global field. And so therefore it's changing it for both calendars. So this gives me the ability to have independent calendars that are both window independent and layout independent. Um, so what I've done is I've just created a merge variable and I've established uh, the variable for the month and for the year. And, and normally what I've done uh, is just, in this case, I've just kind of created these variables, but what I would do is put them in an opening script and it would grab the month and year based on the current date and it would establish my global variables for month and year. And then here, using the hide calculation, I was able to convert the calendar month from a number into the month name. Um, and this is another one of those things that I love so much is these um, uh, merge variables and the ability to use the calculation to basically create uh, whatever value that you want in that merge variable. So. That in, in, the, in the hide calc. In the hide calculation, correct. That's what I mean. So, yeah. yeah. So I've got the month and the year, and then 
Another thing that is just kind of a, a technique that I like to use is I like to uh, use uh, script parameters where I can put everything into a let function that I want to uh, for parameters and for, for variables. And then so in, for this particular technique, the only thing I need in a script is just I need to evaluate the script parameter. And that's essentially all I need to be able to manipulate all of those variables is a script that evaluates the script parameter. So I just have a, a simple setup here that just advances the, the month. And if you get to December and you're going to January, it also advances the year. So, so pretty much just kind of a simple variable driven selector for what month and year that we want to look at. So that gives me a starting point. And then you're refreshing the objects on the screen as part of that script, right? Correct. Well, in this case, while I'm building it, I'm using a refresh window. Um, when I'm done building it, what I'll do is I'll wrap everything because we're going to need to refresh multiple objects. Um, and so what I'll do is I'll group those objects and give that an object name and just refresh that. One of the neat things that I discovered when it comes to refresh object is that if you have a group of objects and you refresh the group, it will refresh all the objects within the group. That was golden because up until I learned about that, um, I was using a lot of these type of techniques that rely upon refreshing those objects. And so I was having to do multiple refresh objects in order to get that refresh to happen. Uh, and then one day I came upon, uh, I don't remember how I discovered that if I, if I grouped them and then just refreshed the group, it refreshed all of the objects within the group. And so that was really, uh, I was so excited to find out about that because that simplified a lot of stuff that I was doing. That's right, sweet. So, yeah. So we're going to go ahead and just drop a portal in here. Let's see. Uh, oh, what am I doing? Portal, right? Yep. Yep. Okay. And well, before I do that, what I should probably demonstrate is what we need for tables and uh, relationships. So for tables, I've got two tables. One is the data that we're going to pull from when we start to look at populating the calendar. So that is kind of uh, the afterthought. But for the calendar structure itself, I just need one table. Um, in my other solutions, I just use a global table and put the fields in a global table. In this case, I can actually use um, this one table. I have an ID. I have a calculated record number. And then these, these fields here come in when it's time to start pulling the, the data. So in my relationship, all I've done is I've done a table uh, occurrence of that same table and then just matched it by ID and uh, using the, is that the courtesan join? Is that what the, we call that one? Um, so it's just matching to all records. And so what I need. Oh, Cartesian. Cartesian, yeah. yeah. And so basically I've got a layout based on the calendar table and then I'm going to do a portal to the table occurrence, um, and I need seven records because I'm going to have to have seven rows in this portal. And really, any tab the, the table that's used to view the, the calendar um, could be literally any table with seven records in it. I don't need any fields. The only field that I that's really required is a record number field that tells me what record number I'm looking at. Oops, what did I do here? So I need seven rows. And we'll just stretch it out to kind of fill in. So that's where I start with is just a portal with seven rows. And we'll that. Uh, did I do? Sure, I'm not using the use alternate row. So, and then I'm going to anchor it. Okay. So that's all I start with is a portal with seven rows, and then the next thing I need is a button bar. And the button bar is going to need to have seven segment segments. 
And then I have a style that is a portal row button bar that Ron, apparently you've designed a theme around this that brings all this stuff in so nice and clean without all the yeah, I'm using a I'm using a custom theme that I've put together, but I nice. yeah. Let's see. Uh separate dividers. It's not completely flushed out when it comes to the theme, but a couple of little adjustments should get us where we need to be. And then I will probably need I need that, and then we'll go back to the portal and we'll take out the bottom row on the portal. Oops. And you can make an add-on out of this and not have any JavaScript in it at all. Yeah. I uh, have not explored any of that yet, but that's some of the things that I'd like to look into as time goes on is, is to be able to do some of my things like this and be able to figure out how to do them as add-ons because I'm not quite uh, at the point where I understand how all that works yet. <laughs> so, uh, so there we have a grid that gives us 42 uh, squares, which is basically what we want to build our calendar after. And so the important thing here is that by anchoring the button bar within the portal, now when the portal expands, rather than expanding the number of rows, so if we didn't anchor that, what would happen is that we'd just get more rows, uh, right? Where are we at? Got to do that one, but not do that one. That's what I was looking for. So then if I did that and I did that, I would just get multiple rows. Uh, still something weird going on. But when I anchor both of them, then the size of each row expands as well as the the button bar. So now we've got that expansion from left to right. So now we have to figure out how we're going to populate this calendar. Um, and that all starts with determining the date. So each one of these, uh, each one of the button bars, buttons is going to need to, first and foremost, before we can do anything with it, we're going to have to figure out how do we tell this button bar segment what date it is going to be working with. So on the first row, it's pretty easy. So we'll, I'm going to go ahead and just start kind of putting in the, the date calculations. But I want to go, I like to do my calendar dates bottom left, or bottom right, I mean. Uh, and we're going to go here. And so this first one is easy enough. And I'm just going to go ahead and do it in a let statement because we're going to build on that. Date equals... And what we need to do is get the, the uh, we know what month and what year we're working at. We know within the top row of the calendar, we're gonna be dealing with the first day of that month is gonna be somewhere in the top row of that calendar. So one of the things that we are gonna be, that we can work with is knowing that um, the next thing we didn't need to know is so, okay, wherever the first day of, the, uh, of that month falls on, we need to figure out how to get back to the first day of that week. And so what I've done is created a custom function that when we feed it a date, in this case, we're feeding it date. Uh, oh. One, no, wait, month first. <laughs> Month. Oh. All right, we're doing and one and cal year. And then this custom function is built with an offset so that if you wanted the first day of the week to be a Monday rather than Sunday, for instance, you can actually offset it. Um, but I'm just going to go ahead and put a zero in there. So date, week begin, um, starting with the first, and then tell me what the first day of the week is. And then we'll just. So that first one, we get 11-27-2022. 
which is today's date. So that didn't work. Let's see. Okay, current date. What do I need? Give me just a second. I'll grab the correct calculation. Did something wrong there. Uh, so week began calendar. Uh, oh, week began was established somewhere else. Yeah, that's what I'm looking for. Oh, I'm back to here. I'm going to make this smaller. Zero. And then we're also going to just need the day from the date. So. Why am I still getting 27? Anybody see what I'm doing wrong? <laughs> Again, date. With this thing. <sighs> oh, that's why I'm in December. So it was working correctly. I just thought I was looking at the wrong month. October, September. Yeah, so the 28th is the first day. Uh, is the first of September fell on a Thursday. And so Sunday, the 28th, is the first day of this calendar grid. Oh, okay. So that gives us the first day. So the idea being that for each one of these, I can then take the... Now I have to do plus one. Do. Oops. Six. Okay, so that's easy enough. That mm, oh yeah, no, it wasn't easy enough. What did I miss? I need to be. It needs to be calculating as a date. So where is? Let's just try this one. Eight eight plus one. So we need let's establish some data here. Oh. 
That's where it needs to be. That should be the right place for it. Yeah, there we go. All right. So the fun part about this is now whenever I have to make a fix like that, and one of the things that I'm going to show is when I finally came to the more finalized version of this, I'm establishing a lot of this stuff uh, in one place and then drawing from it so that I don't have to keep going through and making changes seven times. Oh, no, this one should be five. That one should be four. Can I ask you a question, Ron? Sure. You, it's a question I think I have an answer for. I'm not sure. This uh, cal calculation you're doing and then adding a number to it. Yeah. To try to establish that variable date. Yeah. Can't that variable date be established in one place and all you'd have to do here is say date plus one, date plus two, date plus three? Yes and no. Uh, there's some aspects of it that can. However, uh, as we're going to continue building this, what we're going to find is one of the things that it relies on is going to be what row is it on? Um, and so the only place to be able to establish that has to be on the within the row that it's on. So, and I'll, we're basically getting to that part now. So that was that accomplishes getting us the first week of the month. Shows us what the first week looked. Oh, what did I do? Um, don't worry about it. it's presentation anxiety probably everybody goes yeah through. that's yeah it's exactly that so this and, and john's done more presentations than any three of us combined so he he knows of what he speaks i hate doing it live i'd be showing a video that i've made already hmm. yeah no it's definitely that uh presentation anxiety While well, he's doing it, I just mentioned that there's a trick I found you can use that the, you can establish a, a, a local variable in the under a hide condition for the entire window, establish it once. That's why I was saying that maybe, depending on how this goes forward, you can keep in mind establishing the variables if they if it applies to everything across in one place and then just reference it and then the lack of the minimized calculations in that dialogue might go faster. Yeah. And uh, there's actually, as this progresses, uh, there's, I'll demonstrate where I do a lot of that stuff where I start to pull the calculations and the variable cool. into a centralized location and then draw from there. Great. Hey, Ron, I hate to interrupt. Uh, yeah. Can you ch check the people to see who's waiting to get in? Oh, Sorry. Yeah, that got away from me. It's hard to watch when you're actually doing the presentation. Oh, you're doing yeah. everything? Jeez. Yeah. You're running the self-checkout counter and all the cash registers. Yeah, I guess I probably <laughs> should have uh, made Jonathan an admin today or something like that. Okay. He doesn't want to take back all that authority. Yeah. <laughs> well, I just got an email from what, one of the... Yeah. Well, actually, it came to the group. Uh, so anyway. Yeah, welcome to those who just joined us and my apologies for leaving you guys in the waiting room. I'm trying to present and, and monitor that at the same time. So uh, I'm sorry about that. In case you don't know, he's, Ron's building a doomsday clock here, so. Yeah. All right. Yeah, what I'm trying to do most of all is just slow down and get past that uh, presentation anxiety. Eh, don't worry about it. Get all over the place. Okay. We're I think all, we're finally all competitive enemies here. Finally accomplished what I was trying to accomplish. Yeah, was to, Look at that. To establish the dates of the first week of this calendar month. Um, so with September, Thursday starting on, uh, or uh, first of the month being on Thursday, uh, Sunday being the 28th. And you know what would really help is if I actually, oops, that's not what, uh, We need a 
we need a button bar to show us what day of the week we're looking at. So we can take the same button bar up here. And actually we'll use header button bar for this. But our calculations got B. No, we're going to need this. Yeah, the day name is basically what we're going to be looking at here. You know how many times I've wondered if we could just have a button bar that lets you fill across. Yeah. That what? That would let you fill across. Oh, yeah. Same count oh, plus nice. one or something, you know. Whatever. Well, with with uh, with uh, repeating fields, you can do get repetition yeah. uh, and have that be part of the calculation. But you, I haven't figured out a way to do that with button bars yet. I haven't yeah. either. Essentially, yeah. I mean, most of what I usually do on... Uh, button bars is I will establish what position it is and then I'll I'll assign it a position and write my calculations to so then I can copy and paste the calculation in all the button bars and just change the position number and it changes how so all right back to Okay. Yeah. This needs to be there. Okay. So now we've got our days in there. I also want to just tweak this a little bit so that we have. All right. So now we've got our days for the first row. Um, so how do we make, how do we get the days for the other rows? Well, what we need to do is establish what row we're on. And that's where the, the record number field from the portal comes in. So I am going to. Portal row? Yep. You use portal. Okay. Can you get portal row from within a calculation in the. I would think. Oh. And maybe that's something because for years I've always known that in order to get the the record number, you had to have like a calculated field at the other end of the relationship to show record number. Maybe that's something I've been doing so long I've never questioned it. Yeah, see, see if portal row would work. Get get is, is there a get portal row number? Active, active portal row number. So oh, active, that, yeah. Okay. That yeah, I didn't work. think you could just, that would be a nice function right there, just get portal row. Okay, so we yeah. can establish the portal row by getting the record number. Um, okay. And then what we're going to do is we're going to say, essentially, what I'm going to do is just adjust the record number because for the first row, we need the record number to be zero because we're not going to adjust the calculation for the first row. So I'm going to adjust the record number by going record row minus rec row equals record number minus one. So that sets us to a zero, one, two, three, four, five, instead of starting at one. So then from there, um, date equals. So what am I? What I need to do is add add record number times seven. Right. Exactly. So um, plus seven times row. Let me do that as this. Okay. So that should get, add seven to uh, the date based on what row number it's in. So, uh, so now we'll have to 
this is the fun part of doing this is kind of actually before, let's verify we've got that right before I copy it into all seven what just happened here There we go. Okay, so row two should be the fourth. So let's see why we didn't get that right. Let me see if I can cheat and go to my, one of my completed ones. <laughs> Yeah, oh, do you, first, you first Monday didn't seem to be calculating in row one either. Didn't calculate correctly. That's the final result after I kind of tried to simplify everything. Centralize it all. What was, who was it that commented? What was the comment? Well, I, th uh, I think on the live data, the the Sunday there, the first field wasn't calculated properly. It showed up as a nine. If that helps you. Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> so we completely screwed oh, the boot. That's the cal one calculation you replaced. Right. But why did it give us a nine for the first row? And my guess is it's looking up a different month, but I don't know. No, the month hasn't changed. So from right here, if we were to, this is where our problem does that, would be. Does that need to be added to the day of in the month, you. your month calculation? Yeah. It needs to be added so, to the to the date in the end, basically. But well, could we add it right here? Well, the first row is going to get zero anyway, so it shouldn't add anything. Right. First row shouldn't add anything. Okay, so that keeps it at nine. But it should be multiplying for the second row. Eight plus seven times row. Hmm. Let's see. Uh -oh. I messed something up over on this live one. No, that's not the right one. I have to drop out in 10 minutes for a uh a meeting. Um, this will be recorded. We can watch it later as well, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, really enjoying this a lot. I, I want to sit through the whole thing and I cannot. Okay. Well, I'm glad you showed up and joined us and we'll uh, catch up with you later. Thanks, Miss Everybody. I'll watch a few more minutes, then silently disappear. Good luck with uh, presentation anxiety. All right. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Leslie has to take off too. Okay. Yeah. It, does uh, everybody have the the YouTube channel uh, saved? Because uh, you could just go check that in a couple of days, and it should be there. Oh, I know where the problem was. I grabbed the current. I didn't grab the right table of currents. So there's a link to the YouTube channel on the copy of our front of our web page. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, always fun when it, it turns out it's a simple, it was a simple thing, just couldn't see it for who liked me. So I was just simply grabbing the record number from the wrong table of currents. So we've got the calculation correct now. Oh, oh by the way, you only need six rows. Is that, need, is that seven? Okay. So seven rows gives you 49 days. You only need 42. Right. Oh, yeah. I can't forget that.
So this is why I build this like this. The other thing I always do too is I really don't use, I prefix my let variables with curly cues there. That makes it easier when I'm doing each one of these instead of losing track of. So this is going to be plus position. And then all I have to do is whenever I do this is. Yeah, I like to do that too, where, where if you've got something that increments from calculation to calculation, put it in a variable at the top so that it's easier to find and replace. Yeah. Like that, yeah. So now when I'm going through and pasting this calculation, this is just change the position instead of having to, especially as, you know, as I do more of this and that calculation tends to get more and more complicated, then when I go to copy and paste it, I forget where I put the, where I needed the position. So. Six. Let's drop that to six rows. And <laughs> still, still running into a problem. So what happened to... Oh. Uh, I converted to my squigglies. I forgot one. <laughs> I think the last time I tried to build a calendar natively out of FileMaker, I ended up doing a 42 grid square grid. It wasn't expandable or anything, but and the number of times I had to go through and do 42 different fix 42 calculations was this was about six years ago when I tried to do one. Years ago, I download I downloaded the uh, uh, free calendar from uh, John Sindler. Um, um, whatever the name of it was, um, yeah. and it had a lot of these techniques in it. So, not that, and it was using uh, uh, repeating fields, so because I was before button bars. <laughs> so that's the starting point. That gives us our forty-two square grid uh, calendar point. We're able to establish the date for each one of the grids. Once we've established the date for each one of the grids, then uh, you basically can do all kinds of different things with it. <clears throat> so one of the things that I ended up doing that I'd like to do, so now we can put in a conditional formatting and specify. What we're looking for is uh, if month date, is not equal to month, and we'll give it a little bit of a table so we can create. Yeah, that's the starting point for that.
Conditional formatting, like calculation boxes and stuff, hasn't haven't changed in forever either, have they? <laughs> trying to remember what it was I was thinking would be nice. Oh, the ability to copy and paste conditional formatting instead of having to recreate. Oh. Uh, that would be nice. <laughs> I get that. Yeah, right. Establish the code. Oh, where did I go wrong? Hmm. All right. Hey, Ron, could you bring that calculation up one more time? Sure. Month, date is not equal to count months. That's the one from my. So. Where have you set Cal month? That's the global that's already set. It's already set. Okay. Are you sure that that's set? Yeah, that's what we're getting that month from. And here, bring it over. Yeah, Cal month nine. Hmm. Okay, well, I'm not sure where I went wrong with that, but... <laughs> we get the idea. Yeah, and I think what I was going to go, where I was going to go from there is kind of switch over to... Uh, let's do this. Let's switch over to one of my existing ones. Let's pull this one over. And so one of the things, reason why, like I keep comparing the calculations from this one as I'm building it and they look very different. So here's what I actually ended up doing um, is I established certain variables um, here, which is basically the hide calculation for the portal 
because the portal loads before the Fetten bar does, you can create uh, variables here that will carry over and be accessible by that uh, button bar. So things like the row field. So this way, when I copy and paste this into another solution, um, if I'm using a completely different table to grab my, to base my portal on, uh, I don't have to go through seven times and change the record number uh, field. I can just change it here and put in get field, get field name, and then in the calculation, it'll use get field um, and pull this variable calendar offset. So, so I'm establishing some variables. Um, my numbers, I wanted to be able to have them uh, shade differently if it, and so I've just kind of put in, again, that way I don't have to go through and do that with uh, um, conditional formatting <laughs> seven times. I can just do it here. And then this is just, in, normally I would establish this in an opening script. This just kind of says, if it's not already established, then, then base the calendar month and year on today's date. Um, but if it's already existing, so once you start manipulating, this won't change it. And then I kind of switch that over to single variables um, to use in my calculations. So I've done some layering here on this one. Uh, and there's arguments to be made like, uh, so I started with the base button bar that does the conditional formatting. Um, and so now when we look at the conditional formatting, it's pulling the record number field um, and establishing record number by get field, row field, minus one. Uh, the calendar, the, the date, beginning date of the, it was already established in that other, in the other hide calculation. And then I can adjust it by position and record number. And then the end result is that I get the right response. <laughs> Um, and then instead of putting the, the numbers in this same button bar, I don't remember exactly why I did it, but I just layered another button bar. And that button bar has the number calculation to for the day, the day number. And so that calculation is here. And so again, I've established those uh, variables in the hide calculation in the in the portal the portal so that when I drag and drop this onto uh, another solution, I can have it up and running in moments. Um, so oh, and I'll just say elegantly simple and very attractively designed. I have to go. Thank you, John. Appreciate it. See you. Bye. So in building the solution, Essentially, what we were working on was just getting the base structure of getting a calendar grid that showed the correct months and the correct uh, days, um, and then essentially manipulating with that. I still don't know where I went wrong with these uh, conditional formattings, but I'm going to delete them anyway until I can figure it out. So, if you so when you run that in um, Web Viewer. Do you have any issues with the uh, layering? When it uh, when WebDirect, there's a couple of things to be aware web of. WebDirect, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. 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 So in WebDirect, and I'm always conscious of the layering in WebDirect. So in this one in particular, I've layered it so that the only one I need to be able to click on is the one that's up front. So I've I put the, the button that has the data and has uh, the script to open up the window to show the, the details and everything is on this button bar. And I always I make sure that one's up front. Um, okay. And the other thing when it comes to uh, the refresh, the reason why while I was building this, I had it set to use a, a refresh window. But uh, for those who are not aware, refresh window is not our friend in WebDirect because it is a very ugly experience when you refresh the window in WebDirect. So it's definitely better to use refresh object. Um, and that's where the, the so when I group it and, and give it one object name and I can refresh it and uh, it'll refresh all the objects within that group in WebDirect, that's seamless. It doesn't have that flash. It doesn't have that, that clunkiness that refresh window does. 
If I was using just FileMaker and this solution was only going to be used in FileMaker, I might just use Refresh Window. But um, in order to make it Web Direct compatible, then I, I definitely have to use the Refresh object, uh, at least to make it attractive <laughs> so that it's not doing that ugly window refresh. Because yeah, it has to download pretty much the whole layout again yeah. if you refresh the window. Yeah. Yeah. Is that where you can use the refresh group that you talked about? Yep. Yeah, that refreshing object and, and grouping it and, and doing the refresh object to the group name, um, that's, the, that's all about not having to use refresh window. So you can basically refresh uh, any number of objects on the window. I mean, I imagine you could put all of the objects on a window in a group and, and refresh that group, and you could probably accomplish the same thing as refresh window but without the screen flash. So, so anyway, once we've established uh, the structure and we've been able to assign each uh, segment and tell it what date it's working with, then the possibilities for pulling in the data just becomes a matter of taste. Um, but the one thing that, that kind of holds is what I've done is I've created a relationship. I've got a table of times entries. Uh, this is from a tie block system that I pulled in just to import to have some data to work with. Um, and then I've created a couple fields uh, for the relationship with, that basically tell me the beginning date of the calendar grid and the end date of the calendar grade, grid. And then I establish my relationship to pull in the data that is within that date range. Um, I also have uh, added a global field, uh, which contains a one to a static field that contains a one on the other end, because that's a technique that I use a lot of for refreshing a relationship. Um, again, going back to the idea that this calendar control system, this could be a global field. This, the month and the year could be a global field and you could be using these, um, buttons to just set the field differently. But my preference is to go with variables instead of global fields, because that way I can have them uh, have different values on different layouts and things like that. But when doing that, one of the problems is um, you have to refresh the relationship for the data to update. So um, basically it comes down to uh, relationship keys, global keys versus calculation keys. So you can use an unstored calculation as a key for a relationship, but in order to get that to update, if it's based on a variable, you have to refresh the, um, the relationship. So the relationship won't, won't change. In other words, in order to refresh the relationship, you have to refresh some part of that relationship, but a calculation field updating does not qualify. <laughs> so um, so when I change the date and my calculated begin and end date changes, that doesn't refresh the uh, that doesn't refresh the relationship. So these are my this is my begin and end date right here. And so when I change this, it changes that calculation, but the field on the layout and the relationship itself won't change the data that it pulls in won't update until you actually trigger that relationship. And all I'm doing is setting that global field to one. Um, and even though it's the same value, it's still that refreshes the, the relationship. So I would just go here and put set field calendar G1 to one. And so that allows me to update my data when I do the, uh, when I navigate through the months. So, this is built the same way. So all this data is basically being pulled through that relationship. And when I go from one month to the next, if I didn't have that, that set field on that global, then that data would not refresh. So, so what I'm doing to pull in the data is I'm, you know, this is where I would end up layering another button bar. And this one, I'm just going to make it a little bit sm smaller so I can 
differentiate between the this one and the one behind it. I'm not going to want segment lines on this one uh, or dividers. I'm going to put that to none. So now I just have an invisible button bar. Uh, we'll do it something like this. And then I would come in here and I could use in this calculation, this is where I could pull in the data that I'm looking for. Now, in order to pull in that data, I'm not gonna save that yet. What I'm doing is establishing that one relationship and I'm pulling in a list of all of the data within that date range, but I'm creating a calculation field in that table that concatenates the data that I'm looking for. So it's going to be calendar data. And so it's just a concatenation of the date, the ID, separated by a pipe. And so the end result of that looks like times. to September, then you basically get a list of data like this. <clears throat> and so now all I have to do is figure out a way to pick and choose from this list of data which ones I want for each one. Well, we know what date, so all I need to do is figure out which lines have the date that I'm looking for, and that's where the while ca calculation comes in. So what I would do is create a while calculation that loops through all of these lines of data and it, it would hold and in the result, it would put in the ones that have the same, that match the date. And then I have all the data for each day. And then from there, then I would further parse it out by using a, a get value and things like that to be able to grab the data that I wanna do and manipulate and form, format it however I wanna format it. So That takes some time <laughs> and it takes some doing. But uh, in the end, as I said, I was able to create three different ways to use this calendar that came in very handy with, for the two different projects that I was working on. Um, and I had the complete, the ability to manipulate it however I wanted to manipulate it. Does anybody, do we wanna go through how to uh, do that while function so that we can pull that data out of there? I would like to see that. Yeah, okay. I'm good with that. All right, so I will do the best I can under the uh, performance anxiety, the <laughs> presentation anxiety, and see what we can come up with. So, and I've noticed that this it really comes down to a lot of different preferences uh, as far as how you break this uh, while function down. So I'm going to break it down just the way I pre my preference works, but I'm gonna separate out the variables. I'm gonna separate the condition and then the logic. And the result. All right, so one of the first things we're gonna need is result needs to be established even though it's empty, you have to have, you have to establish it. Um, and then down here, this is going to be the result. And then we're going to be working with our list of data. So I'm going to put list equals, we'll do times calendar data. And then we're going to need to get our date. And in this case, let's see what kind of look it looks. Just trying to look in the data set so we can just give it a date that's there. Nine forty. And then our condition. And again, this this comes down to a matter of just personal preference on the way people do this. I like to uh, 
go through and take the first line of whatever list of data that I'm working with, do my comparisons with it, and then throw out the first line. So every time I'm doing, uh, every time I'm doing a loop through, I'm evaluating the the first value. So once I do that, the end result is that. Oops. Could you also do that by incrementing the the uh, get value? Yeah, you could. You could. Uh, okay. Yeah, you could certainly just uh, get a value count of the number of values you're doing dealing with, and you could tell it to loop through that many times, and each time you could increment the the get value that you're utilizing. So again, personal okay. preference, but my preference is to uh, do it this way, where I'm just peeling back the layers, peeling off the top the top value of the list, evaluating it, and then getting rid of it. And so I do that by, we're gonna loop as long as uh, the list is not empty. And then as part of the logic, we're going to, oops, it's gonna be right values. Value count inline list. Oops, minus one. Yeah, that's it right there. So essentially, we're just counting the number of values and we're starting from the right and taking that number minus one. So uh, essentially, it's cutting off the top top value every time it goes through. And then I can establish my result here by result equals. And one of the things that has killed me with working with this while function, I have ripped my hair out so many times, uh, a couple of different times, and just could not see it. But when we're evaluating a loop and we're saying, if something is true, then create this result, we always need to make sure that we're including the result from the past loop, from, from the previous loop throughs. So every time we go through a loop, what we wanna do is make sure that we're saying include result. So whatever previous results we've established from the previous times through, and if uh, date equals, and then in this case, we're looking for the first value. So we need to we need to break down that first line. So we're going to substitute uh, get value list one. If we're going to substitute the pipes. And so that we can then do get value one. So we're basically, we're taking that first line from that list of values and we're breaking it down to a list um, and multiple values. And we're grabbing the first value, which is the date so that we can compare it to our date. So if date equals get value of the list, then we want to get We want to keep that line. Okay. And then oftentimes if I've got something wrong, if I try and close it, it'll show me where I've messed up. So you need a, a semicolon and a quantity there. Yeah. Uh, right values, value count. Oh, I didn't put what I even, right values list. Oh, okay. There, there we go. go. So there we go. And so that's now looping through and it's picking out, pulling out whatever line has uh, the 30th, matches the date. Um, and so just so we remember what we were looking at, this was our, oops. This is our list of data. So we only had the three lines. The first, first one was the 30th, and the second one was 
or the 26. So if we come back in here, we change this to the 26, we should get the other two lines. No. All right, 926, yeah. You're on October. No, I think what's, uh, oops. I think oh, what, I see. Yeah, you're in you're in October and you had a September date. Oh, okay. Right, and that one value uh would have oh yeah, so now we've got a much bigger data set. <laughs> this is the data set from September. I remember there'll be the overlapping from the beginning of the grid and the end of the grid. So that's where we were looking at. So uh, let's see, let's see what I find a date that has some. Let's do what one that has more than one. Nine nine. Let's try nine nine. Okay. Yeah, so we should be getting a result. Oh, let's go back and see where we're at. All right, so oh, and actually, result should be and. Anybody seeing it? I think that date calculation somewhere, but I don't see it. I think it has to do with the result because it's grabbing it's oh it's coming true if it's the first line of data matches and then it's not am I list equals right values list value count list minus one so that should be chopping that first value off each time it goes through. It's like it's only evaluating the first line. Okay. Let's duplicate it so we can tear it apart and see what's going on. <laughs> Basically, I'm there. Tell it to rebuild itself. Yeah, so it's still only evaluating once. Ah. No, that's not it, because that should be. Oh. Always know when your wow function is going a little off when it starts doing that stuff.
It's trying to loop infinitely now. <laughs> Supposed to stop after fifty thousand, isn't it? <laughs> well, while we're waiting, maybe I'll shift the topic just a little bit. This is really elegant. I okay. like it. Um, I, and I love the the interface of it and can build from that. But what I'm looking behind it for the data for an application, uh, an in-house application is to actually build a calendar server that can push out and update um, those ICS files. Mm. I'm wondering if anybody has any experience or can point me in a direction on that. I've, I've done a little bit of looking and may I may have to build a standalone calendar server and just use FileMaker to control it. Um, you know, with... Uh, standalone module but would wouldn't that just be a, a matter of um, finding the the ICS format and just generating that manually and send that out as a as a a link or a file um, in yeah but I'm a, I actually want I want to talk to the calendar and I'm not sure of all the science behind that so that it's uh, you know when, oh. when you update a an event and you add in the zoom link or whatever it is. I'm not sure what happens in the, the events here, but um, you know, those things can all happen transparently. And I, I just working to figure that out. Looking if anybody has an experience, great. If not, I'll learn it. I haven't done that. Uh, I'm sure there's, there's a format published somewhere yeah. um, that you could look up. Uh, but yeah, you're right with all the, you know, the accept and decline buttons right. and all that kind of stuff in there. Yeah. There's, a, it's pretty rich. Yeah. Hey, it's the Riddler calendar. Yeah. <laughs> Not sure. Where, I think. Yeah. Something with my calendar year went wrong when I, I had to end task it. And so let's. Fix the calendar year. Uh, there we go. That should fix it. There we go. All right, so since I had to end task, we wiped out our previous uh, oh. calculations that we were working on, so we'd have to start the while function all over again. Uh, I don't know that we want to get back into that or just kind of. That's all right. I think the general idea was that once we've established the calendar and what day each segment is representing, then we can manipulate the data from there. Uh, so we can get a data set that's within a date range, and then we can use the while function to loop through and, and grab the data that we need that matches each date. So that's that's generally the concept. Um, and I imagine there's probably ways that uh, somebody else might think, might decide to go with a uh, uh, execute SQL maybe, uh, use SQL to grab that data and then parse it out. Um, there are probably ways, many different ways. I imagine that uh, you could probably use JSON to parse out that data and things like that. But, but from this point, this was kind of the the starting point was simply just being able to, to build the grid structure and most importantly, making it, you know, expandable, making it stretch and, and resize with the layout um, and then everything else is... And Execute SQL would do a nice job of building a, um, um, a an ordered array for you. Uh, then you would you might not have to do as much calculation to figure out what's going to be on that date. You could sort them by date in the process of building the SQL. Yeah. And and then just say, okay, I want to take this record 
for this day and this record for this day and that kind of thing that might that might be a possibility or you could even just grab the without even having the relationship for the the related table for the data you can just use pure execute sql to grab the data that matches that date and, yeah yeah but my question would be because i've had some mixed results with execute sql and uh, depending on how you use it and where you use it, sometimes it could be extremely slow. Um, yeah. and it can really cause some, sometimes some problems with, uh, you know, bogging things down. So if you'd had 42 different execute SQL calculations going, uh, on this layout to try and grab the, the correct data, I wonder what that load would look like. I would be hesitant to do 42 separate execute SQL calculations, yeah. but I wouldn't have a problem with doing one to to build an array of the whole uh, 42 days. Yeah. And then have that or or even or, or even just for the current month and have the other days blank. Um, either way. Uh, but I wouldn't have a problem doing that once and then parsing out uh, uh, the individual parts of the, the, the resulting array. Right. Uh, in case you're, you're still, you'd still have to further like break it all down, probably using a while calculation to loop through it and grab which, what you were looking for. So I would, I would think just to uh, get value, you know, if you, yeah. if you figured your calculations, right. Um, you know, having multiple lines in one line of the, of the execute SQL array yeah. might work depending upon what, you know, and th then you could get creative with your, with your uh, delimiters and, and then break it down uh, in a, in a simple straightforward calculation per date that you wouldn't probably need the while calculation. But anyway, yeah. if, well, if I may, may I bring, bring up another point? Sure. Um, You've illustrated an awesome technique using button bars. There's one other thing that I really like about button bars is that you can turn them on and off. Mm -hmm. And so if if you're doing a report, now I'm, you know obviously a, a, a calendar is going to be a fixed, you know, six by seven. But if you're doing a report, say you're doing a report that you want to be able to say, okay, specify which months you want to do the report on. And so you could set up the, uh, the button bars to, to make, to hide the, uh, the months that, the, that, that don't have, that aren't being reported on or, or the, the segments that don't have, aren't going to have content in them, you can hide those so that you could have a one report that would have like, if, if you had three, three months, like you're doing a quarter and you had three months that you were going to show or six months or the whole year, it, the, the same report with the same 12 uh, segments of the button bar would be visible, uh, would would be in the in the the line, but if you make them certain ones invisible, the rest of them would stretch. So you'd have three going all the way across, or six going all the way across, or twelve going all the way across, and they would automatically resize. And so you could be really flexible with a report uh, using button bars with a, a calculation to get the contents. Um, <laughs> And that would be a really cool, that's a really cool way. I've done a couple reports that way that uh, give you a lot of flexibility and um, and they automatically adjust to fit the space. Uh, so it, it looks real clean. So, so anyway, that's just a, another, uh, another way to use button bars for uh, tabular data. Yeah. Yeah, button bars are amazing. <laughs> There's... They've definitely opened up a lot of uh, different techniques and different ways to use them. Um, one thing that kind of has always frustrated me with button bars, though, is one behavior that I don't particularly care for with button bars is, and so if you have a button bar that has five buttons per se, and you and and you do a uh, 
and you do a calculated hide that's that conditionally that says, you know, only show these three for this particular person. And the button bars now shows three, but the buttons are bigger. Um, what I'm getting at is that I think I would really would be nice if that you had a choice of how to anchor your button bar so that if you had three buttons going across or five buttons going across uh, all the way across and then in, and for some reason somebody two of them were rendered invisible instead of spreading the other ones across the full length it would take them off the end so in other words the five buttons would look like this instead of having five buttons stretched out. So does that get what I'm saying? In other words, buttons would drop yeah. off instead of stretching. Because um, if you're doing that conditionally and you have like a low level user may only get to see one or two buttons in a five button button bar. But now those buttons are stretched all the way across the the layout instead of you know being able to kind of stack them. Well, Here's what I'm getting at because I, I essentially accomplished this anyway with my menu system um, that I use in all of my solutions. Actually, yeah, I'm just trying to figure out what to, probably hey, you can do that with tabs, but you don't have as much control over the button bars, right. I'm using the wrong password for that. Well, Ron, I wanted to thank you very much uh, for this, but I've got to run. Okay. And you all have a good day, and thank you very much. It's been great. Thank you, Tim. Take care. Have a great day. So this is something else that I've uh, developed over the, is this menu system that conditionally shows and hides button bars based on uh, parsing out the layout list. But so what I'm getting at is in order to accomplish this, I had to do, uh, for instance, there's a possibility of six buttons across here. I had to do six individual button bars instead of one button bar with six buttons because I wanted to be able to have it, have the buttons remain the same size, but how many, how far it goes across is based on how many buttons show up. So instead of stretching all the way here with only two buttons, only the first two would show. So I ended up having to use individual button bars instead of being able to have one button bar with six buttons. And that right. can get- you could, Like I said, you could use a tab object for that too. Just just the, just have the tabs visible and you can do that because you can, you can specify whether you want them flush left, flush right, yeah, justified, you know, so you can, you can, and then whichever one you hit, you got a calculation that says, okay, which button was hit, and then, and then do what it says. It kind of, it would, it, it would require different calculations, but you could basically do the same thing as a button like, bar. But can you hide tabs based on calculation? Yeah. yeah. Individual tabs in a tab set, you can actually hide individual ones. I didn't think you could do that. Um, well, let's just go here and take a look at what I'm, well, I haven't used. I haven't actually haven't had used uh, tab sets in forever. Uh, you know what? Now that I think of it, you may be right. Yeah, that was uh, when you have different tabs. And you have a hide calculation. I don't believe you can do a hide calculation on just one. It just, yeah, it's the whole tab set. So, yeah. So, yeah, that's the drawback there is that you can't conditionally oh, hide. Man. Sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. I just, yeah, I just made a fool of myself on. <laughs> No problem. I don't know about you, but I haven't used I haven't used a tab set in God, I don't know how long. Every single thing that I ever use that looks like a tab set is actually uh, sliding panels, uh, slide controls, and button bars for the tabs. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I use just go to object to go to the different panels and 
that gives me some some ability to conditionally show and hide the the tab buttons as well. Um, so I haven't actually used a tab oh, set in God knows how long. I, I know what I did. I'm sorry. Um, you can use conditional formatting to make them invisible. They don't they don't actually hide. They just become uh, not visible by uh, picking the right colors. So, yeah, that's what it was. I did. But as far as button bars go, I mean, that was, that's the one little quirk that was kind of uh, that I don't particularly like that you don't have the choice whether to tell it to expand when buttons are visible or drop off one end or the other. It'd be nice if uh, it'd be nice if when you went to do the the anchoring that you could anchor either the button bar or the button differently. If they could do that, then you could tell it, you know, uh, whether or not to anchor the button bar and then if anything disappears and you can anchor the button anyway hard to yeah. is what i'm trying to express but yeah that's on the that's on the level of of being able to hide an individual tab on a tab object yeah. um yeah so you want more control over the individual item yeah yeah and its behavior so yeah but it's not yeah. Way more than we had 20 years ago, let me tell you. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. Popovers, uh, card windows, button bars, uh, the kind of things that came that have come along in the sliding last panels. Years, slide yeah. panels. Oh, I can't even. Uh, I had developed years ago uh, a, a technique for mimicking a popover that was basically a tab control uh, with hidden hidden panels, um, invisible, like invisible background panels. So that the initial panel was invisible. Um, and then when you clicked a button, it went to the second panel and it basically mimicked the appearance or, or of, uh, of a popover. But the, the worst part about that is that if you wanted to have a popover that popped over whatever size it was, well, basically invisible or not, you've still got this tab panel that always has to remain on top right and uh so if you and i had a couple of layouts that had several different what what i called at the time that i created were popovers but that meant having several different invisible tab sets on the layout and so yeah trying to work with that overhead and trying to, you know, keep that, if you had ever had to work with anything underneath them, you had to move them around and move them back again when you were done. You that was sure before that. you could, before you could hide them in, in layout mode. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, it was almost, it was, I've had this experience a couple of times where I had put so much work into developing a technique for mimicking a popover. And then one year, all of a sudden, oh, here you go. Now you have popovers. So my technique was completely invalidated. It was like completely went out the window. <laughs> well, you know, they used to use uh, repeating fields uh, as related records oh, before wow. they actually had relationships. Yeah. Yeah. Now we're going way back, back in the day before they even had related records. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, there's there's been a lot of stuff that has come about, especially at the layout level with all the different objects that we can use and all the different ways that we can manipulate those objects. And it has come such a long way and we can do such amazing things with all that. But there's also a lot of overhead to it, especially when it comes to uh, a lot of that stuff and how they behave in web direct takes a lot of extra management to get everything to to behave properly in web direct but, but web direct is getting better every time you turn around yeah it is it's amazing what it does yeah so and i think you know i think that the future for filemaker is probably going to have to have a lot of attention paid to web direct because i know like especially since the pandemic and so many people have gone remote like everybody I work with expects a web browser access. You know? That's why they're doing Clara Studio. Yeah. 
to to be able to have you know online forms yeah but even still the people who used to be sitting in the office opening filemaker to do their work you know uh, like my employer my clients they all now expect to to just be able to access it through a web browser and uh you know basically use web direct like everybody wants web direct right as long as they're part of the work group that's that's right. easy enough right. you can buy up a license um but um but a as there are more and more more and more people who need to interact with the system that are non non named users yeah you know the the I'm I'm excited what what uh, Claire Studio is going to bring us down the road, kind of like a, a, a FM Better Forms approach. Yeah, yeah, for that anonymous access. Yeah, yeah, because all that stuff is you know I've definitely had some experience trying to do a lot of that stuff in with the data API, and there is a lot of heavy list lifting involved with that as far as learning. PHP and you know all learning how to set up the web pages and the web server and everything to be able to access it through the data API and you know learning how to write in HTML for God's sake is just like man <laughs> it takes a lot of time and a lot of learning curve to get up to speed with that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. I know because I I spent a lot of time working on all that, trying to get up to speed with being able to provide that, and then and now here comes Clara Studio. <laughs> I'm gonna basically make all the work I did on that obsolete too. <laughs> oh, I don't think so. Just gonna yeah. be another mountain to climb behind it. Yeah, yeah. There's always gonna be use case scenarios that just aren't gonna fit. You know? Yeah. So. Yeah, and the ones that I've developed aren't, I don't see uh, Studio being able to fit those. A uh, couple of them are simple, you know, contact forms. So that's where Clara Studio, I'm sure, comes in great. You got a website and you fill out a contact form and it deposits the data into FileMaker so you can use it. That's easy enough. But uh, some of the other stuff was actually pulling up invoices uh, and being able to then go through and process payments and do all that kind of stuff. So I've, I think Clara Studio is probably going to be a bit far away on that yet. Yeah, it's going to be down the road. Um, they they have said that they're going to do some of their internal systems with it. So I'm expecting big things yeah. that, that hopefully before too long, it will get beyond the one way. Right now, it's pretty much just one way, like a, a survey monkey kind of thing. Here, you fill this out, and send it in, and it's anonymous and, and um, and there, there's no connection to an internal account yeah. or anything like that. Um, but down the road, they're going to have to do it two way to make it really useful. And uh, when they said in one of the meetings I was in that they were actually going to do some of their own projects in it, and so they're moving towards being able to to facilitate that. That's going to give us a lot of power, yeah. um, and I, I hope that's sooner rather than later. <laughs> That reminds me of a few years ago, I was uh, trying to develop uh, browser access and, and uh, to be able to do credit card processing. And when you was utilizing a certain plugin um, and actually had to pay them to modify the plugin a little bit and went to go, when it came time to pay them for that plugin work that they were doing, I was surprised that they weren't using their own plugin online. <laughs> like they, they didn't they weren't using their plugin in a web browser to process the way I was trying to use their web plugin in a web browser to process. Yeah. Oh, the the word they used when they were talking about doing some of their own systems, they actually used dog fooding as a verb. Yeah. And I wrote it down. Dog fooding as a dog verb. <laughs> yeah, you know, that. eating your own dog food. You know right. that, that expression that you're using your own tools, that they yeah. use stock fooding as a verb. <laughs> oh man, I never heard that before. Yeah, that's like I use FileMaker for my invoicing and to send out my invoices, and I actually have online payment available for paying my uh -huh. invoices and stuff too. So, you know, kind of like 
showcasing my own work by utilizing it for for my own internal nice yeah. okay yeah. well as far as the presentation goes i think that's about it as far as uh covering that one of these days uh it's on my agenda to do some some actual blogs and stuff and i'm i'm hoping to work this one up as a as a blog on my website eventually but this would be a cool one yeah yeah i need to clean it up a little Sorry. bit more for for distribution uh, stuff like that so there was someone that asked in the chat chat that who had had this sign off if you were going to make this available as a download or something so they could play with it uh i uh yeah that's the intention is okay make it available uh it's not quite ready but when it is i'll i'll probably i'll put it on my website and make it available so yeah i, I wasn't as prepared as i would have liked to have been for this one i just didn't well i know how that goes yeah <laughs> Ron, this is excellent, really, because I've got some solutions coming up that I could see using this, and I may reach out to you to give a hand on that. Fantastic. I'd be happy to help. Yeah, it's always it's always uh, gratifying to get a little feedback and find out that, yeah, I really did do something here. <laughs> yeah, it works nice. Yeah. Well, and I like that uh, you actually kind of went through the whole development process uh, it takes a little bit of time to do that, but it, 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 as we were talking before you started recording, it causes us to engage and to yeah. learn, pay attention as opposed to you're clicking and clicking. And I can't remember even, can't even see where the mouse goes. Right. Yeah. So yeah. Good. Yeah. And, and it, that draws from my experience as well, when I'm watching a presentation and, and when they're just kind of reviewing what they've, what's pre-built, they pass over stuff that you're like, wait a minute, what? I didn't understand that part. And because I didn't understand that part, I didn't get any of the rest of it because right. there was such a, like there was a key piece there that, that I missed um, because it went too fast. So yeah. yeah. I've given a few presentations like that. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. It, it's a, it's a challenge learning how to do these presentations because every time I get started on one, I find myself next, I keep speeding up and speeding up and flipping all over the place from one place to the other. And I'm like constantly trying to remind myself to take a breath and slow down. So what's that? Well, it is, this is in a video, so people yeah. will be able to review it. Yeah. All right. Well, I guess we can probably call it a call it a day unless anybody else has anything. Thanks, Ron. Th thanks, Ron. We'll see you next month from Pause on Airs. Yep. Live from Pause, Pause on Airs. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Take care. All right. Care. You guys have a great day. Thanks. Thanks. Oh, by the way, Jonathan. Oh, too late. He left. <laughs> All right.